On this episode of Athletic Training Chat, we have Dr. Anthony Breitbach, who is a champion of interprofessional education and collaborative practice and gives so much insight into the nuances of it and the education and how it looks and how it can be completed, um, both from looking at the athletic training side, reaching out, and also just really showcasing what we do as athletic trainers. I would get into a lot of details on that and also the education side and what that looks like in terms of getting professions to work together and figuring out how to go through that. We talk a lot about dual identity development, which I thought is a great concept and a great way to look at it um, from the larger team and it's truly important. So tons to take away of this. Great follow-up to our episode uh, with Caitlin Place on interprofessional collaboration. As always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. Thank them for supporting us as a podcast and the profession in general. Check them out for all your sports medicine needs. Uh, new things coming out if you follow them on social media, both with ankle supports and new kits. Always innovating. If you've got an idea, get in touch with your rep. Uh, they'll be happy to hear it. Um, or if you need to try anything out and see what's going on, they will also be happy to help you with that. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode. This episode of Athletic Training Chat, we are on with Dr. Anthony Breitbach, who, amongst many other things, is a professor, a vice dean, uh, and has done a lot at St. Louis University. Uh, I have come across a lot of things related to him on social media and otherwise just over the course, um, but we ultimately connected uh, because we had put out a previous episode on um, interprofessional collaboration and space and spell check got me and hyphen or put a dash in between inter and professional and that's how we originally connected but then in talking some more um and we will link these up if you look at his kind of google scholar list of all the research and um everything within this realm that he has done you'll see why we wanted to talk further about interprofessional uh collaboration and everything and so before we get into that i just wanted to turn it over to you to kind of fill in a little bit of your background um, and then we'll kind of jump into a broad definition of it and then get into some more of the details. Yeah, th thanks, Joel. Um, and, and just go ahead and call me Tony. That's that's uh, no problem. Um, I uh, in, And that happens, Microsoft uh, likes to hyphenate uh, interprofessional, whereas in the literature, we, we do not hyphenate it. So that's just one of those little editor, journal editor things that comes up from time to time. So I'll tell you a little something about me. I am um, I am at St. Louis University. I've been here for 22 years, um, and um, I'm a, a full professor. And I I helped found the athletic training room, the athletic training program here at St. Louis University 15 years ago, uh, but just recently moved over to a new position of vice dean in our college. Um, originally, I'm from Dubuque, Iowa. Um, I um, from there I went to do, uh, the University of Iowa and. Um, and I was a, a, a I was in the undergraduate athletic training program there, um, and then uh, for graduate school I went to the University of Florida in Gainesville, and um, you know when I graduated from in 1987 from Florida, um, I got a chance to go up to Milwaukee to help uh, um, start what eventually became Aurora Sports Medicine Institute um, in in Milwaukee. Um, was there for two years. Um, I got a chance to work at Scottish Rite Children's Hospital in Atlanta for a year. And then I got a chance to go back to my hometown. And, and our, our high schools in our hometown never had athletic trainers. Um, and I got a chance to start a program in Dubuque to be the first high school athletic trainers in Dubuque, Iowa, which was a tremendous point of pride for me. And I started to dabble in education a little bit. So um, with Clark College and our Clark University, um, I was involved with helping get their um, accredited program uh, up and running. Um, and But I realized that I probably wasn't going to uh, get very far in education without a, a terminal degree. Um, and a colleague of mine from Clark ended up coming here to St. Louis University. And he said, he said, you know, uh, St. Louis University has a great tuition benefit for, for staff. 
um, and they're looking for a head athletic trainer. So I applied for the head athletic trainer in 2000, and where I was the head athletic trainer here for seven years for the Billikens um, from um, 2000 to 2007. Finished my PhD in the same year that the AT program was getting established in the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training here at SLU. And I've been very, very lucky uh, to get a lot of great opportunities, work with a lot of great colleagues. And so now, you know, now we're here, you know, 15 years in and and, and things are going pretty well. That's awesome. All right, that's a, cool to hear the background and just, you know, that it wasn't the one education, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, and just all the interwoven and how that ultimately works out. I think that's always kind of a unique story. That's, I mean, I am working on a PhD haven't quite finished up yet, but thought it was going to lead to being an athletic director. Now I'm working on a clinic and kind of going off of other routes. And so it's just always good to know yeah, that yeah, it can yeah. kind of come full circle. You know, it's funny. I've been really lucky to be on some dissertation committees for some some working professionals who are getting their PhDs. And and I, I love the fact that I can take my own experiences and say, hey, I know what it feels like. I know what it feels sure. like to work a 12-hour day and come home and either have to go to, you know, have to be on an online class or your homework done when your kids want your time all of those types of things like that um you know that's that's a that's a you know it's a challenge the other thing i'll tell you about and this will inform our discussion moving forward is the fact that the working as a clinician the work ethic that we have as athletic trainers is trans is a transferable skill to any line of work so um you know, when I became an academic, you know, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't know enough to philosophize. I just basically took my same work ethic as an athletic trainer and say, what do I need to do? Teaching, scholarship, service. Um, and then I found some mentors in each of those areas and, and, and I just kept working hard. And I think, um, and it's allowed me to be successful. So, you know, those same, that same pride I had as an a, a athletic trainer working clinically, I really tried to keep applying it as, as an academic and um, and just, you know, learn from the best and and try to just keep getting better every day. And I think uh, I think it's 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 been good to me over the years. So. Glad to hear. Further confirms everything that I've been trying to tell my significant other as we're working our way through this. So um, just to kind of start off all of this, could you define kind of interprofessional education and collaborative practice and kind of just everything that goes around it slash then also bringing in why it's been such a big interest to you. Okay, so th that's great. So what's funny about athletic trainers is that we've been working collaboratively for for 100 years, right? And, and the thing is, is um, we didn't really have a name for it, right? It was just athletic training in our book. And so what we found was, is that, however, and how did we know that somebody was good at it was we at, we figured out what school they came from, right? You know, like, oh yeah, you're a, you're a Wisconsin grad or you're a, you know, you're a, you know, you're a Seton Hall grad or something like that. And then you would know, oh, okay. Yeah. They, I know how they work there and those types of things like that. And then, and and that that's a fairly imprecise way of of quality assurance within within healthcare, right? You know, hoping they end up with the right mentor and teacher. Um, what we do with interprofessional education is, in, and we actually started a special series in the Athletic Training Education Journal called Interprofessional Education for Collaborative Practice. So what it is is that collaboration's hard. It's not easy, especially when you're working with people that don't really, may not have the same background as you, may not have the same um, kind of point of views as you, and you got to get that sense of, you know, conflict management, communication, all those types of things. So interprofessional education, by its definition from the World Health Organization, is when learners from two or more professions learn about, from, and with each other to um, uh, enhance collaboration, to improve health outcomes, okay? And all of those parts of that sentence matter, right? You gotta have multiple professions, right? Number two, you need to learn about, from, and with each other. So about is always first, because that means we can't really work with someone until we kind of know who they are, what they know, 
those types of things like that. Mm -hmm. And then we start learning from each other. And then we can really start learning with each other. I think if you think you're going to walk into a situation and you know everything, um, it's going to be hard to collaborate because everyone brings that their own personal biases and all those types of things. And then it's designed that we collaborate better, but we always have the North Star of improving health outcomes. So it always has to go back to why are we doing this? We're doing this to learn to collaborate better so that we can improve the standard of care for our patients and the individuals um, we take care of. So when I when I made my transition over from athletics to academics, we had a fairly robust interprofessional education program here, but I had never really heard of it. Sure. Um, but I didn't have any students yet. So I was hired in 07. We brought in our first cohort of students in 08. And so I had kind of a year where they needed faculty resources in the IPE program. I didn't really have students to teach in AT. So um, I started teaching like every one of the IPE classes. And I'm like, this is this is kind of what I've been doing my whole career. This is this is pretty awesome. You know, coordination of care, um, communication, uh, dealing with different levels of stakeholders, uh, you know, uh, uh, finding win-wins, all those types of things that we do every day as athletic trainers. I just found that we we were part of this, but because athletic training has in many situations isn't at the table for a lot of those dis those kind of IPE discussions because they're not in colleges of health professions, they're not in medical schools, they're not in those kind of things like that. It was a foreign concept to us, but the idea of collaboration is not foreign to athletic trainers at all. So so once I realized that, and I realized that's when like the the a light bulb came off in my head. It's like we've got to, we've got to spread the gospel here. Number one, we've got to educate our profession more about what this whole interprofessional education thing is, mm -hmm. because we'll be good at it. Number two, we got to educate the other professionals about the value of having athletic trainers on your care teams, because of the specific skills that we have that allow us to help these teams work better and and improve collaboration. So then kind of going into maybe more of what the research that you've done is, you know, what have you been finding in your research? You, you kind of give that very great, you know, kind of broad overview of that. We've always been a part and aware of collaboration, you know, and doing it, but not necessarily as tied into it. So what have you seen um, through all your research, which kind of now knowing more of your backstory has been quite a bit in not a super long period of time. So you've definitely been busy. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, that's the cool thing about collaborative research. Once yes. you really like it and you kind of get pretty good at it, um, you find a lot of people that want to work with you. So I, I've been really fortunate um, to be able to be a part of, and you can accomplish a lot in teams. Like, you know, generally when you, when you do a research project with a team of people, you know, there'll be two and three and four papers that'll come out of that based on different aspects of the project, with sure. different people taking the lead all those types of things like that. So so my early research was came out of my work on the executive committee for education. So we were part of the group that developed the future directions of athletic training uh, document. Um, one of those recommendations was that interprofessional education should become a part of athletic training um, professional programs, okay? Um, so, so the process that I just talked about that we needed to educate our profession and we needed to educate other professions. Um, I worked with Russ Richardson, who was the chair of the ECE at the time, and we developed a work group of, of 23 individuals that wrote this white paper called Interprofessional Education and Practice in Athletic Training. Um, and it was really a cool process because it was a lot of people who weren't kind of, um, were maybe younger, younger researchers, and we really were able to bring some people together and um, write a cool collaborative paper. Um, it was given an award by the ATEJ um, for contributions to athletic training. Um, and it was really got things started. So, and it, and then from then I started to do research. So that was really more of a review paper. Then I started to do research um, amongst KD programs. I started doing, uh, working with people and doing research around kind of uh, uh, faculty and clinicians views of, of IPE. 
and finding out exactly the same things that we talked about what I talked about earlier is that we we we're, we like collaboration we work well at it we don't feel like we're always at the table um and and that creates some conflict uh sometimes so part of that was then I started looking at more and more different types of applications of that because a lot of the research in interprofessional education is really episodic right it's we did this one cool thing, we're going to assess it, we'll write it up, right? But who who knows if that's that's transferable or has any generalizability, right? So then what the goal is, since my early research has really been about um, creating more multi-institutional arrangements, creating more um, longitudinal studies. Um, so that's what I've been focused on ever since. So taking that early knowledge I've gained and um, and stretching it and widening it. So I want to make it longer and wider, right? So mm -hmm. you want to study study effects over time and study effects over multiple institutions and with multiple intervent uh, multiple assessment instruments. So I've been lucky enough to become an associate editor for the Journal of Professional Care, um, which is really kind of the flagship IPE journal based out of London, and. And that has really helped me learn a lot too. When you're when you're reviewing articles all the time, you're seeing all the sure. research that's out too. So so really, then the the third thing that I've done is I've tried to look at different engaging with different um, groups as far as um, studying athletic trainers' interaction with them. So I've done a paper about athletic trainers and dentists, and and I've done, started to do some international work. Um, and that's where I really kind of focus my service work is um, I got a chance to be um, the liaison for the Association of Schools Advancing Health Professions um, from the NATA. And once I got into that group, um, once again, our skill set is transferable as athletic trainers. So what I found is that I became a very valuable member of the organization because I just was effective at getting things done. So I was able to, um, I became chair of their interprofessional task force um, I, they, and, and got several kind of recognition by that association. But it also allowed me to be their representative on the interprofessional education collaborative um, council, which I got to be at the table there and be the only athletic trainer in the room. So I started finding out that I could serve our profession best by getting in all these other groups. and and sharing the gospel of athletic training there. So, so I started to be involved with the ASAP, IPAC, which is the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, um, American Interprofessional Health Collaborative, which is a member organization. Mm -hmm. I've been on their executive committee for a few years now. And then I was, got a chance to start up a, an athletic training academy with several colleagues in the National Academies of Practice. So um, two years ago, we started the inaugural Athletic Training Academy in the National Academies of Practice, which is really an association that's dedicated to interprofessional um, collaboration. So, 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 you know, I view, I view my service to the profession as being a voice for the profession and these other. I really enjoy. Trust me, everybody in the room knows I'm an athletic trainer. That is not. I don't like take my athletic trainer hat off when I walk <laughs> in the door. I mean, I, I, I do that. So, so that I really, really enjoy doing that because, and that stems back to some of that, those issues I saw when I first started getting involved with this was, you know, we have to, we have to learn more about them and they have to learn more about us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've really dedicated myself to do that. And, and then I've gotten a chance to do some international things. I've done some, I did, a, I did a study over at Altogether Better Health at Oxford um, with a legendary researcher. I just kind of fell into it. It was pretty amazing. Um, and then I got a chance to do a, uh, from that research, I got a chance to do a collaboration with somebody from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and, uh, and we published a couple of papers um, together also. So on, on job satisfaction and interprofessional collaboration internationally, among sports scientists and, and sports medicine professionals, athletic trainers, because they call them different things in every country. Right? Sure, sure. 
athletic therapy and, and physios and all those types of things like that. It's fascinating how quickly things can like stem off in this in this profession and the in the world with so many different options. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. Been debating which one of these questions I want to ask first, but I'm gonna ask the one and see if you kind of cover the other. If not, we'll follow it up. Um, but as you're probably aware of, and you've kind of referenced, and I'm um, sure people listening, like at times it can be very difficult for to get people to work together within your within just AT uh, that happens. But then also definitely, you know, trying to build that collaborative team of complementary skill sets. What have you learned that has led to potentially the best outcomes, as you've kind of referenced in a lot of the research you've been doing for that type of collaboration? Is there any kind of underlying principles, if you will, or any ideas that seem to kind of cover or at least show up the most frequently? So, so number one, you got to get to a sense of common purpose, right? You got to get to a sense of you got to bring yourself back to that definition and say, you know, our goal here is to probably provide the best level of health care as we can and check our egos at the door, folks. We've got, we've got to figure this out. And it's hard sometimes, right? Especially when you're in fairly political organizations that are very competitive, they're, you know, in athletic training and people keep score, right? And so um, our, our, you know, most of, most of the environments, most of our athletic trainers work in, um, they're keeping score in some way. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen some colleagues, unfortunately, you know, lose jobs because they're part of programs where they don't win, right? And that's that's a tough environment to be in to try to check your ego in those situations because it affects your it affects your livelihood, right? right? But if you can get to that shared goal of our goal is to provide the highest standard of care, number one. The IPEC competency domains, there's four of them. So one of them is interprofessional communication. So you need to have good communication principles, right? Number two is roles and responsibilities. You have to have a sense of roles and responsibilities. And, and that takes us into one of the things that we try to when we, we teach people in their professional education is we we don't all become Swiss Army knives, okay? That that a fairly useless tool that you only use out of sheer desperation, right? You you know, who would choose to use a screwdriver or the corkscrew on the Swiss Army knife? Not many people. But if that's the only thing you got, of course you're going to use it and it's very useful. So 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 one of the things that we like to do is you main within interprofessional teams, you maintain your professional identity. But then you also get what's called an interprofessional identity where you know where your skill set best functions within the interprofessional team. So it's called a dual identity formation. So you not only maintain your own professional and personal identity, you also develop this sense of interprofessional identity. So you have a dual identity where you say, no, I know I know who I am as an athletic trainer, but I also know how the athletic trainer is going to work well with this profession mix that we have, you know? And I think that's that's really important too. So roles and responsibilities. The next one's a team and teamwork. There is a science to teamwork, right? There's There's, you know, um, I, I love going to practice. Like I, I'm a team science nerd. I love watching coaches coach. I love, and, and I just love how, how they manage interaction, how they adapt to, how they adapt to, um, uh, challenges, how they, how they handle success, all those types. There's, there's, there's a science to teamwork so that you need to understand how teams work and use good um uh teamwork principles when you come for that so okay so i did i say three or four so interprofessional collaboration roles and responsibilities teams and teamwork and values and ethics for interprofessional collaboration it's got to mean a lot to you to work together you got to think that hey you know what to us together is more than the sum of our parts right and so we have to know as a group that you know what we're going to provide a higher standard of care by working together than what we can do just handing it off to each other. And, and so that's that fourth area. So if you can address those areas, develop that 
shared value structure, communicate well, uh, manage the, the mechanics of being a team, um, and then truly kind of evolve that interprofessional dual identity. Um, I think those are things that are su be being successful on collaborative teams. I really like that dual identity and the interprofessional identity. I had not come across that before, but I really like that concept and how that kind of fits in. You're not removing the importance of the individual, but you're highlighting both that and what it contributes to the team. Uh, that was kind of tying into my kind of next question, but um, maybe just see if there's any more elaboration on it. You know, there's a scene, I think, in a, a couple of the titles of your research, you know, collaboration as a team sport, and you just referenced it. Um, but is there anything else that you kind of wanted to highlight and kind of referring to it in that way? So number one, it's a catchy title, right? It's 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 <laughs> like uh, so. Um, but th the project that we did um, over at Oxford at All Together Better Health, we actually did what's called the World Cafe, where we took a lot of the participants from the conference, we brought them in a room, and we posed questions to them about what are aspects of sports that because sports i mean teamwork is very very important in sports right and there's a lot of money and they invest in it to get it better and you know so so as a result what are aspects of team sports that we can apply to healthcare to make healthcare better you know and i think if you think about the demar hamlin incident that's one of the things i always tell people about that when we talk about that is is of course, we should deliver CPR. But the fact that they, they were prepared and delivered it at a high level and worked together as well as they did, that was the wondrous thing. That was awesome. Because we all become certified in CPR, right? But the fact that they worked together the way they did and one of the coolest things I heard after that is when the ER, the doctors, the cardiologists from and then from the medical center raved about the quality of the of the CPR and the oxygenation that the that the brain stayed perfused with oxygen. That's the winning combination right there, right? Because they were ready. They they delivered when it mattered and they had a good clinical outcome, right? That's where they, they're two or more professions. They knew about from and with each other. They, they collaborated effectively and they had a good clinical outcome, right? There's our, there's our definition, right? Yeah. And so we look at sports, what do sports do that maybe healthcare doesn't have, right? Number one, they have clearly defined roles. In sports, people know what their role is. There's a coach, there's assistant coaches, there's a quarterback, there's a there's a wide receiver, there's a lineman. Clearly defined roles. That doesn't always happen in healthcare, right? Number two, they invest in high impact practices, right? So what's a high impact practice? Is practicing, right? They they rehearse, they go through things before you have to do it when the bright lights are on. So that's another thing that that we've showed as athletic trainers with our with our um, with our um, medical timeouts, with our EAPs, with our rehearsal sessions. We've been a, we've been pioneers in those areas, and I think that's something that's really really important there. Also, um, I think um, they have clearly sports has clearly defined success. We sometimes, we sometimes can do the best job we can ever do in our life, and you still don't have the best outcomes, right? You know, you, you, and and I think, I think that's that's one of those things where where um, you understand at the end of the day in sports if you've been successful or not. Mm -hmm. In healthcare, that doesn't always happen, right? Sure. You 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 try to get people a little bit better sometimes, and and. And that that can be really difficult as a provider. So those are lessons you can learn is is defining what finding ways to define success and goal setting, really clearly identifying roles and leadership within teams, and giving people time to get to know each other and to 
to practice and prepare and um, for when they have to work together. I like it. I, well, I just like how every little bit of piece you've thought about and how it all fits together. Uh, what have you found, you know, again, having experienced it from the clinical side and then obviously all the work you've done on the educational side, both as a professor and on the research realm and not just seeing it within the aspect, which I think is also something that's really unique about the work you've done is it's not just in the quote unquote traditional setting of athletic training and the collegiate um, with a lot of your experience, you know, there at uh, St. Louis, but what are the missing piece pieces, however you want to define it, in the educational and professional aspects of athletic training when it comes to interprofessional collaboration? Um, to be honest with you, and we were just talking <laughs> offline, I don't fully remember like having a specific dedicated class to it. Um, that's probably on me as oh, much as yeah, anything sure. else or how much it was talked about. Uh, I know in my experience, we had an AT that was also a PT, but they were kind of assigned to a single sport. Um, obviously, we had physicians coming down. I had some massage therapists with one team we worked with, but then we didn't really. Other than that, I, maybe a chiropractor came in every once in a while. I can loosely remember. Um, but we weren't necessarily fully exposed to it. Got, saw more of it in grad school, and I got fortunate. We, I got to work with a couple really cool people, and we just had a good um, – thing there but i'll stop oh, rambling yeah. I mean, i'll stop rambling I mean, to let you answer the question no no this is great think of think of ems think yep. of the conversation you have with ems before every game that's interprofessional think of sports psychologists think of every time you accompany someone to a physician appointment you have nurses you have medical techs you have radiology you have everybody there think of the sheer amount of um uh the sheer amount of collaboration that we normally do that we take for granted. Number two, number two, the term interprofessional really, really wasn't start being used widely till really the 2000s. Uh -huh. um, there was a couple of key papers um, that were like crossing the quality chasm and, and some other key reports that were put out by the Institutes of Medicine um, right around the turn of the, um, you know, uh, you know, the year, year 2000 kind of in that neck of the woods. Um, but the real report started and didn't really start coming out till 2010 and those types of things like that. So, so it's okay if you didn't hear the terms because not a lot of other people heard them either. Um, but another thing is it's important is that we, now that we know what they are, is that we, we realize that we need to make sure our graduates understand the, uh, the value added skills that we bring as athletic trainers. So another thing that's, you know, that's that there's some unique aspects to just our regular clinical training that um, as students that we get that maybe a lot of other professions don't. And, and we need to own that skill. Like how many other health professions have people see them doing their job? nobody right usually you go into an exam room and you know maybe there's one other person in the room i mean i would take care of people at a freshman football game and there'd be a couple hundred people in the stands wondering what johnny's doing on the sideline with the athletic trainer looking at him i mean i mean now they have the tents and all that stuff like that yeah, yeah, yeah. those are those are those are way before my time and <laughs> and um and uh and and the and those types of things so like things like that that and, and the fact that we have to manage unreasonable time frames, like we, athletic trainers manage very unreasonable time frames. Like literally, you know, that kid who gets injured on Wednesday, they're bound to determine to play on Saturday. I mean, they all absolutely right. are. So, so those kind of things are all skills that we bring that can be a part of what's going on. However, there is some, there's some other sides of, of the healthcare system. There's some hierarchies that can be very, very frustrating, right? And these are hierarchies that haven't just showed up. They've been here for a long time. You know, the, the kind of traditional position at the top, um, some of the other professions, and, 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 and we're not the only people that have issues with those hierarchies. They, everybody does, but 
you've got to find your way to be to keep advocating but you have to not give up because there's hierarchies because they are kind of in the system and they're mm -hmm. going to take a long time to change but you can't change them if you're not in there being positive and being an agent for that change so like you know be that person that be that person that says we can i know this is frustrating but we can get through this. We can be that person. Also understand that your knowledge is, and one of the things that we try to use in our IPE classes when people get to know each other, we have kind of the, the about part of the class where you talk about, we, we, we try to stay away from scope of practice. Mm -hmm. we, and we, and we, we talk about our scope of knowledge. Like what are the skills that we have what are what are things that I can do instead of what what does this state allow me to do? Like, like what do I sure. know? And and so that's what's really cool about what's happening with the KD now with the new standards is that they went from focusing on kind of that those entry level, you know, foundational skills where they're pushing us to 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 teach um teach some skills that are really at the top of our scope. And not even, you know, technically in our scope in some states, but but we're going to teach all of our students to be at the top of the scope so that they're ready when it comes time to be able to do those types of activities. So so that's another really positive thing. In addition to putting interprofessional education and interprofessional collaboration into the standards, which was our goal 10 years ago, and sure. it happened, which I'm pretty happy about. But but the fact that that we're 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 better understanding our professional identities and that allows us to really better understand our interprofessional identity and that dual identity. I like it. I uh, appreciate the insight on kind of those barriers and some of the missing pieces. Cause I think that's where, you know, people, hopefully some light bulbs start going off and start getting those ideas. Uh, anything else kind of around, this topic, big, big topic uh, that you wanted to highlight uh, that we haven't talked about yet? Um, you know, I think I think one of the things that um, I want to recognize is there's some people that are doing some really good work in this area. They're, they're really, um, you know, I think you look at every one of these consensus statements that has ever been done, and especially in sports medicine, the athletic trainers were the glue that kept it together, right? So those were all interprofessional papers. We sure. just didn't know what to call them that. So, so there's been a lot of good interprofessional scholarships. So, um, I've I've actually been really fortunate. Um, uh, Sarah Manspeaker um, had a sabbatical um, uh, from Duquesne this last fall. Um, she actually came and we worked on some projects together. We're we're guest editors for this for this special edition of the Athletic Training Education Journal um, on interprofessional education for collaborative practice. But she actually came and helped teach an IPE class at SLU. And we had a fantastic uh, time working together. Um, and um, I've always admired her work. And I, it, was, it was great the chance to spend some time with her and, and, and work with her um, for an entire semester. Um, and I think that was really good. And there's a, there's a lot of emerging scholars that, you know, I've had, you know, I've, I've, I've been on, you know, uh, eight dissertation committees for athletic trainers, Nora Kramer um, and, and, uh, and Jacqueline Schwederman and Michael Welch and, and uh, Carolyn Gockel and, 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 a, and, a, and a bunch of people like that. And Corey Oshikawa just, uh, just successfully defended his. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that are, that are, um, uh, that are, that have done a great job and they're, they'll all be, they'll all be growing up as, as, uh, as emerging scholars. So that, that I'm pretty excited about that. So. Awesome. Uh, with that ready for the athletic training chat, training chat questions. Sure. That sounds right. good. True. Um, very interested to hear, and you can, these for you, it can be within the realm of kind of interprofessional collaboration or broad over the profession, however you choose to go about them. But where do you see the athletic training profession going in the next five to 10 years? So I think we're at a very interesting crossroads right now. We are an interesting crossroads and 
And the fact that it happened at the same time COVID came, which caused everybody in healthcare to reevaluate what defines healthcare. Like sure. so, so not only were we making this big transition to the master's degree as a profession, professional programs, we also went through COVID. Yep. And so we came out the other side of it with a whole new with 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 a profession that looks at themselves in a little different way than maybe we did 30 years ago when we just, you know, put our t-shirt on and shorts and went out and you know went out in the sun and worked hard and 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 I love that. I love that sure, it. sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um but the thing is is so as a result, we're really, really excited about all the opportunities that are available. But one of the things that I think is really, really important is that we can't lose sight of the fact that the high school athletic training gig is still a good job. I had so much fun working as a high school athletic trainer. I I I felt appreciated every day. I walked home and 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 you know that was a you know and and now with the activity bus. Those things are a little bit better at high schools. You know, they don't practice till 10 o'clock at night the way they used to. But I think we 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 have to embrace all of the, these new settings, but we can't forget the people that need us the most. And that's those high school, those, you know, they just USA Today posted that that um infographic about eight thousand, you know, high schools don't have athletic trainers. We've got to find a way to to financially support the people that are in those settings um, to be able to provide the care they need and to prioritize it correctly. And and so that's that's a big challenge for our profession. We need to grow. We need to grow and build our build our reputation interprofessionally in a bunch of different settings. But we can't turn our back on 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 that because um that's that's th that is uh that is a that is a place where we can really impact the lives of a lot of people um so that's really really important i also think that uh hopefully we got our fingers crossed that there'll be some new payment models that'll be coming out that'll that'll really recognize and i think there's some people that are doing a lot of work in that area um in some states about about creating greater access to third-party payment systems and stuff like that. And so I think that's really, and if we go to more team-based outcome-based models, I think I think having skills, the skills that we have in care coordination and those kind of things can be really helpful there. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree on both of those. Uh, if you could go back and give yourself advice as a younger athletic trainer, what would it be? And if you could also kind of set the time period that you would choose to go back to. I I I love every every time I I I you know what's really funny is I loved my time as a student I loved my time um, I I loved the '90s when I was working as a high school athletic trainer I and and I you know I I love our students now they're 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 great and the the thing is is as far as what I would say to myself is is um, is is keep keep doing the next best thing, okay? There's sometimes you can get caught up in just the grind mm -hmm. and it gets you down and and don't lose track of the positive impact that you are having on people's lives every day. You know, and I think there's, you know, there's issues with burnout and athletic training and there's issues with resilience, but there's issues all over healthcare with that. You know, and it's funny, I have... My wife's a dental hygienist, and and um, and sometimes she gets down about kind of the grind of, of dental mm -hmm. hygiene and stuff. I said, I said, I said, I said to my wife, I said, but you know what? Every person that you see feels better about themselves when they leave your chair. And and the thing is, is and that's what's the key to really in, enjoying your life as a health professional, realizing that impact you have on people. You know, and and you know, and if we can get away from systems where we're really dependent on athletic directors and coaches and those types of people making decisions about about um, about everything we're doing, you know, 
our livelihood and those types of things like that and get into more of a kind of a traditional uh, system, um, medical system that can be really helpful too. But but my advice to myself would be do the next right thing. And the other thing about this is that I I embrace I embrace the knucklehead um, because I was a knucklehead. I was a knucklehead when I was in school. Um, and so, so, you know what, when, you know, when our students do things that are like, scratch your head, they're like, I'm like, I was that guy once. So you, know, <laughs> you just want to be patient with them. You want to, you want to you talk them through it and, and get you their side. But those are, those are some of the most rewarding experiences for me is that, that, that student who was just trying to figure things out when they came in. And by the end, they really clarified things and they really ended up where they wanted to be. Um, those are the most rewarding things I, I do as an educator. Um, I, have a, I have a saying that I say to our students. I say, um, it's, it's your path. We just happen to be on it, okay? And so if you decide to take another route and take another path, that's fine. I'm not going to be mad at you. That, that's the way it goes. But it's your path. You know, Don't feel like you have to do anything because you're going to let me down or things like that. Just, it, you know, it's your path. You know, and and but you know, make good decisions, right? You know, listen to people and and you know, have mentors. But then, when you make a decision, own it. You know, and and do the next best thing. You know, so I like it. I like that saying. What has been the most influential resource that you have found in your career? People, mentors. Very um, common answer. Yeah, huh? yeah. No, I mean, literally. I, I mean, I I, do, I would need a. I would, I would probably get laryngitis saying the names of all <laughs> my mentors and, and they all came at, they all seemed to come at the right time in my career. You know, I, I needed those kind of practice based mentors, um, that really kind of, um, really pressed me to, to, to not strive for, not allow for mediocrity and strive for excellence. Um, and then I also, when I made the switch over from, um, athletics to, um, from, um, the clinical setting to, to academics, I had the right types of mentors that that really, you know, a, a real good mentor is one that listens to you. It was really funny, you know. I mean, I'm sure you're getting a sense from my conversations with you that, you know, I'm, I'm I get pretty passionate about stuff and I talk about stuff. Sure. And and he would always say to me, this guy, this my scholarship mentor was Randy Richter. He's a physical therapy professor, and and he would sit there and he would write down the stuff I was saying. Like, okay, you know, what do we want to work on today? What kind of projects do you want to do? And and all those types of things like that. And then he would come back with his little notebook a month later when we do our next mentor meeting and say, okay, let's look at the list that you made the last time. Have you done anything? And so then I got to the point where like, I didn't want to let Randy down. So I ended up, but what that did was, is he, he made it about me. He made it about what my goals were, what I was passionate about. And then he, um, then he facilitated my decision making process. So he he kept asking me questions about it. So okay, what do you want to try to study with that? What what question do you want to answer? Where do you want to present that? You know where where are you going to get your subjects? How you you know uh, what type of instrument you're going to use? Like those types of things. But it was my passion that drove it. He just helped direct it. And I think that's the same way with with anything else is. They, a good mentor allows you to be yourself, but helps helps provide you with guidance and information that you know the knucklehead in you do, doesn't know yet. And and so uh, be open to those mentors. By my advice and um, and a good mentor is one that lets you be you and listens to you and and helps um, helps fill in the gaps um, to help you make good decisions in your life. I like it. As an AT in your role, how do you take care of yourself? Um, that's a that's a that's a good question. I mean, I I wish I, I I will be, I will be one of those people that that. Uh, I I'm not the best at it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, like, I like I have a lot of interests. And I like to do a lot of things, and um, I like to work. Um, but I also, I also like to include my family in. The cool parts of my work, right? Sure. So, like, you know, my my kids, you know, my 
you know, every time they were start of the week at their elementary school, they had a couple of our basketball players coming to the elementary school. They, you know, they got a chance to, you know, um, there was a couple of times where they got to go along in the bus with us and, and spend time with us. They came on campus with me all summer. Um, but then moving over to academics was, gave me a, a, a flexibility of schedule that was, I, I'm, you know, when, when I hear my colleagues complain, I'm like, you have a window <laughs> in your office. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and you uh, can, can leave and no one like looks at you sideways. You don't have 50 people waiting in the athletic training room for you. Um, but, and it allowed me to be present. My daughter, uh, and my daughters both played sports. I got a chance to be at almost every one of their events, which was great. Um, but, you know, I, I, I love, I, you know, I think when you, when you work hard, um, you really treasure your time with your family. Um, that's really important. I love to travel. Um, and I've made a lot of really good, um, a lot of good friends internationally. So I've been able to, you know, travel with my work and, and, you know, and, you know, uh, and, and combine it with a little bit of fun, um, which is always good. Absolutely. If you could change or eliminate one thing to be a modality, a common practice, a mindset, or anything of your choosing in the field of athletic training, what would it be? So, so I teach therapeutic modalities. Okay. I teach therapeutic modalities to a hundred athletic training, athletic training and physical therapy students. Okay. Every fall. Um, and one of the things I tell them that number one, modalities are a tool that you will use your clinical reasoning. And if, if it, if it's the right tool at the time, but you also got to remember evidence-based practice is not just based on empirical evidence, right? It's in, and, and many times therapeutic modalities are hard to get randomized controlled trials and those kind of things like that, because yep. you can't blind anybody, right? You can't blind someone to the fact that they're getting a cold treatment or a hot treatment or those types of things. So I tell our students, you have to keep in mind that there's three legs to that stool, right? Yep. There's, there's best evidence, clinician expertise, and patient preference. Yep. So let's talk about moist heat packs, right? Moist heat packs physiologically have barely any value. Like they, you know, they, they barely have any value. And a lot of athletic trainers have like done away with them. What I tell people this is number one, but guess what? Patients like them. Yes. And, and, and especially if you're in a position where you're doing something that they're going to hurt, to be able to get them in a more relaxed state of mind beforehand using a moist heat pack, I'm not thinking for a second I'm raising their tissue temperature at all. Sure. But it does have a sedative, relaxing effect. So then if we're going to put them through an exercise regimen or do soft tissue mobilization or those types of things like that, moist heat might be a good option, especially yep. if the patient likes it. Yep. My question is, is that you don't have to stand there with them for 20 minutes while they have it on them. I mean, you apply it and so forth. But don't use it as a treatment in itself. So like sure. if someone walks in and their therapy for the day is getting a moist CPAC, that's not therapy. That's just a, yep. that's just that's just that's just a, a way of passing the time. Um but but just keep that in mind. So like I'm I'm not an absolutist around those things because because I do think that we've got to give each other some slack that you know, if we relied on best evidence for everything we do, uh, we 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 wouldn't have learned anything. Like, right. You, you um, but I do think we need to keep gathering more and more evidence to better inform our decisions. Yep. And designing better research studies and better interventions and those types of things like that. But I think we also need to honor, you know, the, the knowledge gained over time as a clinician. And patient preference. I think there's some things that, um, you know, um, and, the, and, and going back to the team sport, interprofessional team, the patient is in the center of the interprofessional team. Absolutely. If you don't, if if you, you do not give the patient a voice, then you're you're shortchanging yourself as a as a health professional because that patient voice is really really important in healthcare. Yeah, I. 
appreciate the nuance that you built into that. I think it's so important and it gets too black or white sometimes. And it, it, it just isn't, it can't be. No. Uh, final question. Uh, what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? Well, it's, it's funny. I, I, I talk to people about this and I, I say, we got the disease, right? If, if you got, you can, I can always tell us when a student walks in the door, when they caught the disease, right? Cause there's people that look at you like, why in the heck would you ever do that job? And I look at them like, why would I ever not do this job? Why would I do any other job? And so I, I have driven home tired many days, but I've never driven home from work regretting being an athletic trainer. I love the combination of physical activity and sports, healthcare, and service. I am I love, you know, I I I think helping others achieve their goals is is really a vocation. And I think um, that's what I love about athletic training. I love to I love to be able to provide care, serve others, and do it in a fun athletic environment where generally if you're doing your job right, about 95% of everybody you see every day is healthy. Um, sure, sure. And um it's kind of a fun environment too, right? You know, yeah. and um and I've done stints in in outpatient clinics and stuff like that where you have a list of patients and you see them all day and and all that and and you know and, and there's you know there's people that are very successful in those settings but i i like being part of that more dynamic mix where you're you don't know what you're going to come across every day and you're you're managing everything that comes to the door and and um, i love that about athletic training i love those relationships i love i love the fact now with social media and stuff you can stay connected mm -hmm. to those people that you took care of um um uh, you know, 20 years ago, and you're still connected with them, and you, and you see their kids, and it's and it's crazy. Like, I, literally, I had I've had children of my students come on college visits here. I'm just like, I'm feeling pretty old, but but uh, yeah, no, I that's what I love about athletic training. I love I love the opportunity for service in the setting that we provide it. I I love it. Awesome. If people wanted to reach out to you, connect with you follow what's going on. We'll link all this up. Um, I appreciate you sharing all that in the kind of episode sheet. So that'll all be linked, but what would be the best place for them if they just wanted to connect with you? They want to connect with me. Uh, LinkedIn's a great way. Um, okay. I have a lot of people that I'm connected with on LinkedIn. Um, and I, that that's great. Um, um, I do have a Twitter feed, which is B underscore four underscore IPE. Um, but I also, um, we also started the interprofessional education and practice Twitter feed and the and the LinkedIn group. The LinkedIn group has over thirteen hundred members in it. Okay. Um, and so that's a good way if you want to get some knowledge about IPE and stuff like that. Jump on that LinkedIn group. Um, but yeah, they, and they can email me at. at um, I'm sure you're posting my email address or whatever. They can email me anytime. I don't. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, yep. I can yeah. definitely add that. Yeah. Please add that. I. I. Um, you know. I. I'm. I'm fairly easy to find, but. But yeah, no, I um, I always believe that there's many, I, I I stand on the shoulders of my predecessors and and um, and I gladly, I gladly, want to do the same for others. So, so um, so you know, please anyone reach out to me, I'm happy to always be of assistance. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and reaching out uh, to catch the uh, auto correct slash typographical error on our um, last one uh, to have some more of this conversation and taking the time. So I uh, really just wanted to say thank you again for doing that and uh, yeah, looking forward to connecting in the future. Sounds good, Joel. And it, it's the associate editor in me. I, I like, I noticed those things, but, but no, thank you for so much for reaching out. Thank you for the good work you're doing. Um, uh, spreading the gospel of, uh, um, of athletic training and, and helping people learn more about it. I think, uh, you know that what you're doing takes a lot of work and and uh and um i appreciate that your dedication and the quality of the work you do so um you know reach out anytime i, I, I really appreciate you awesome well, i appreciate those kind of words so but thank you again and we'll look forward to the next time sounds good joel you take care have a good day thank you for listening to this episode of athletic training chat we hope you had 
a good listen with Dr. Anthony Breitbach on interprofessional education and collaborative efforts. Uh, we'll have it linked in the notes. Check out all of the research he's done. There's a ton that you can take away just to help apply in your own relationships. Uh, there was a ton that was built into this. I learned a lot in terms of just a lot of things going around and some of the nuances that go into all of this so hope you really enjoyed that as always uh, thank you to Mueller Sports Medicine for being our partner in this podcast if you want to support us and them in our throw a lifeline program please head over to clinicallypress.org to check out how to donate for that uh, all donations go 100% to funding the supplies for that Mueller provides the kit to athletic trainers that are looking to apply or nominate to get some basic emergency supplies that they have been unable to obtain otherwise. So great cause, all the money goes to it, nothing comes off the top. So we really appreciate your support there and look forward to getting our next one out. Thanks again for checking out this episode.